questions that are often posed to people like myself, Phil, and there's a lot of other agronomists I can see, colleagues of mine in the audience. Um, you know, and, and it's, I guess they're quite common fertiliser questions that trying, we, we need to give you some facts so that you can try and sift through information that you gather in the wider world. And I suppose that was the idea of trying to finish the day with giving you some of these key facts that you take away with you to help digest information that's thrown at you once you, you step out this door. So, some common questions. There's a range of products I've got pictured there. The first one, now you have a handout that actually summarises some answers to these questions. They're not necessarily in the same order. I've presented them a little bit differently, but the answers are there with you. <coughs> so firstly, what, what is, um, why don't fertilisers appear to work anymore? I've had a number of people ask me that over my career in, as an agronomist. And there's some facts that you need to know. One of them is, what is your soil nutrient status today? If it's not working today, what is the soil nutrient status? Let's take a look at it. And of course, doing a soil test is the way to handle that. As part of that soil test, we, we've heard that phosphorus is a key driver of growth. So, of course, use that soil test and home in on that phosphorus level. Let's see where it sits. The other part to the soil test, now I know we, we've, as scientists, as agronomists, as livestock um, extension people, we, we talk all these different phosphorus levels. In the south, we commonly, um, in our extension work, talk this coal well phosphorus extraction method. Olsen is just a different extraction method of phosphorus, but they, they are both types of way, ways of monitoring phosphorus. If you use the coal well phosphorus test, there's another test called the phosphorus buffer index test that research work has gone, gone or been done to help us determine what is your critical level of phosphorus for your paddock. So you can have that phosphorus buffer index test done on a soil test and it will help. If you bring that number to someone like myself, Phil, a range of other agronomists out there, they will help you work out what that means your critical, your optimum phosphorus level is if you were to drive, drive pasture production in that paddock. So they're two, two key elements. But you also, we've talked a lot about phosphorus today, but we're not saying phosphorus is the only nutrient out there. It might sound a bit like it at times, but it's a key driver. But there, there are others. And is there another nutrient deficiency that may confound you know, your response to that first order nutrient. So is there something else, else that might be holding things back? And the soil test, of course, is the way to, to have a look at that. We, we can get a good idea of what other things are doing from a soil test. So this is a piece of work, again, Richard Simpson from CSIRO did on, on the Kyora trial site just up the road here, where he looked at pasture growth rate and they call it a nutrient extraction trial and you put out all nutrients bar one. It was like my picture of Richard's of the pots where everything but one element. So this was just in a little bit bigger scale but in the field. So it was done on Kyora. And you can see all nutrients are there in, in the first bar. So we're getting to our maximum pasture growth. We had all plus lime. We got a little bit more out of it due to the lime, not a lot. I would suspect that's not significant. And then all these other bars are all these other elements. It's everything bar one. So it's everything bar phosphorus, everything bar potass potassium, etc. Magnesium, molybdenum, etc. And that piece of work that happened on Kyora confirmed that we were holding growth back by not putting phosphorus out on that site in the order of 50%. Now we haven't, you'll notice sulphur's not on that graph. We haven't been able to measure that. The, the nature of these nutrient extraction trials, it makes it difficult to measure a sulphur, the, the response to sulphur. But sulphur would normally be behind phosphorus in, a in our pasture grazing situations. 
of, of being a limiting nutrient. Then the next order nutrient that they found that was limiting production was potassium. And it was holding growth back by in the order of 20%. So we'll, if, we move, <clears throat> if we move to this next curve, which is again sourced Richard, he's not here today, but he, he's helped us out a great deal for not being here. Um, between Alan and I, and uh, well, not Phil's graphs today, but usually Phil as well. We, we have this curve, production, pasture growth curve again, developed by a field, the field work Richard did with us, to show this is the curve of how a pasture will grow when you increase soil phosphorus levels out there at Kyora. This is the Kyora site, Bruce's site, Bruce Hazel. And you can see you increase phosphorus, increase phosphorus. This is, this is showing that when you get, you get to a point up here where for more phosphorus being put on, you just don't get an increased growth response. And Alan, you know, Alan's given a taste of this in his talk. But the, the, I guess the extension of it I wanted to show you is that, okay, that tells us we can draw a line on that curve at 90, 90 to 95% production. You never aim for the top because it's not worth getting there. There's too much phosphorus required to get right to 100. It's not, you'll go broke doing it. So let's aim at this about 90 to 95 mark and drop it down. What's the phosphorus level? Well, at that site, we know in order to get near maximum production, we've got to get P to 32. Coal well phosphorus of 32 on our soil test. But we knew production on that site was not operating at optimum. And we were actually op operating on a curve, a different production curve, one that's a bit lower. And the work earlier shows you that we had this potassium deficiency, which was holding growth back. Um, and you know, it was yielding 20% less than optimum because we weren't addressing this K story. So all of a sudden, our critical coal well for this soil, if we don't address potassium, drops back to, to more in the order of that 25 mark. That's what we found with the piece of, of research that Richard helped us with. So you come back to the point, you know, why, why fertilisers, our question was, why don't fertilisers work anymore? Well, we might be you know, you're, you're operating away there on your place, you're putting a bit of fertiliser out and you think, God, it's just not, why, it's not growing. You know, maybe your coal well, your phosphorus reading is somewhere in there, you're putting more phosphorus out, but you're just not growing much more grass for the amount you're putting out. Well, there could well be another nutrient deficiency kicking in there that's holding you back from realising your optimum at that site. So, so it's about, you know, you've got to start piecing bits of information together, seeking advice from people you think know what they're talking about in this area to try and work through the, the, the reasons why you might not be realising your potential. So same question, moving on. There's other issues to think about. Why, what about the amount that you're putting out of whatever the product is? And what's the form of the nutrient that's in it? We've talked about the various forms of P. It's critical to know what those forms are because they tell you how quick you will get a response. We might have a form, if it's not working, we don't see lot, much response to what we're putting out. Well, it might be that, that that form is not readily available and takes time to work. The other one, We've talked, various speakers have mentioned today, but this pasture composition issue, you know, in, in order to realise a potential um, growth response in a perennial pasture, you've got to have legumes present to, to make that happen. Because, I mean, Alan highlighted it beautifully with it, that you've got to get that nitrogen cycle kicking to be able to get the whole sort of situation, you know, rising to a new level. So legumes must be present. And and always having some, some history on, on what fertilisers have been used on that place and how you've grazed stock, what sort of grazing management patterns it is. It's, it's vital information to trying to piece together that story of, of trying to answer why may I not be seeing a response anymore. 
Okay, next question. I, since working in this alternative line of work, I've had umpteen people, of farmers, resellers, all sorts of people, it's, it's a range, say to me, yes, but that product doesn't lock up phosphorus or doesn't lock up nutrients. I think we just need a little back to basics lesson. I think Alan's given us some really kick starts, this, this sort of, well, I've delved into quite a bit of what I've said, but it's, it's so critical to understand these facts to be able to digest this. Locking up of nutrients is actually a natural chemical pathway that occurs in soils. And it just so happens phosphorus is one of those nutrients that is naturally bound to clays and, and other chemical compounds. It's just, that's just how it is. You, there's nothing magical out there that's going to change it. But recognise that it is an important occurrence to actually have a, a nutrient like phosphorus to hang on. That, that let's use it, turn it around and look at it in our favour. It, it hangs on and it's there ready to be released. It, it's got potential to be released. Others, like sulphur and nitrogen, they can drop out the bottom end from leaching. You know, they're so mobile, they can, we can lose them. If we get very wet conditions, they're gone. If, if there weren't perennials there to, to soak them up. And even if there were perennials, sometimes under very severe saturation waterlogging conditions, you can lose those nutrients. So, wow, phosphorus is on our side. It's hanging on tightly. So let's, let's just look at that. That's, that's a pretty important fact. And if there's no other fact you walk away with today, it's, you need to take this piece of information home and, and, and just keep it in your head forevermore because this is how it is, that phosphorus, the lockup of phosphorus applies to all fertilisers. All phosphorus-based fertilisers have the potential to lock up. A bit familiar, this, this slide. Um, Alan's given, it, given the, the rundown on how this works, but it's, I'm using it basically to show you, to answer this question of why f f phosphorus fertilisers all have the potential to lock up. So remember we've got all this stuff happening under the soil. We've got the pool where the, the plant takes its phosphorus from, that's this soil available phosphorus. And we've got these other two areas feeding it. The inorganic phosphorus pool, so the, the more mineral component type phosphorus material on this side, the more organic, once living plant material sort of stuff on this side. So this plant is relying on these two components being cycled so organic peas broken down by the microbes to feed here. We get inorganic pea coming and going with wetter, more acid soils if it's rock phosphates, feeding this, this soil solution. The plant takes up that pea, it grows, we get animals eating it. It goes through the animal, it goes back onto the soil. We get some of this that isn't eaten, it decays. But the bottom line is that's that, that all is happening underground and you now need to know what fertiliser, whatever you're using, what form, where, where does it enter this cycle? Where, where is your pho phosphorus based fertiliser that you're using entering this whole phosphorus cycle? If it's a manure or a compost, it will be entering down the, this line here. It actually enters into the organic pea pool. So it's, it's, being, it's being put on in a locked up form. It's actually got to be broken down before it's even able to be used. So it's locked up to start with. It's actually got to be broken down by the, these microbes to get it into that form. If alternatively you're putting on a rock phosphate type product, then it, it's coming down and feeding directly into this inorganic pea pool. And remember, it's locked up. Rock phosphate, whatever its form, it is, it is locked up when it's put on the soil. It's not freely available and needs this solubilisation to occur 
before it is available, before it goes into that pool. And remembering things like water-soluble phosphorus products, so single super is a very common one that we use. That's actually had a bit of work done on it prior to reaching the soil. Back there in the factory, they decided to add a bit of sulfuric acid to it and sol solubilise the pea so that it's already in a form that's very plant available. So when you put super on, it's actually feeding directly in to this soil pea solution. So the next point that you need to know, so you now know, know what your form is, know where it enters, and then the next point you need to remember is that once phosphorus reaches this soil pea solution, it still has, it runs the risk of being locked up again. So it runs the risk of being reabsorbed onto to clays, to aluminium, iron compounds, and held tightly again. So it's fact that it doesn't matter what form you put it all on into, once it gets into here, it, many of them are locked up prior to even being put on, but then once they get back into here, they are still able to be locked up again. So, so that, do you, how, how do you feel? <laughs> is, that, is that, you got that message? <laughs> Just politely? <laughs> that, um, there, that's how, how it works in the real world. All right, let's move on. So the next question, I've got two more questions. This plus one other. So do, do conventional fertilisers damage the soil? Now, just like Alan presented for the Wallaroo experiment in Canberra, Ginandera experiment station, this piece of work, again, thanks to Richard Simpson, we had happen here on Kaiora. And it's the phosphorus balance basically on that Bookham long-term grazing Bookham site that Phil Graham instigated back 20, 24 or so years ago, I think. Um, and I won't go into the detail, but you know, we've got this phosphorus cycling through the different components, the organic pea, the inorganic phosphorus, then the very available pool. And the animal eats it, feeds back into the system, not much taken off in a grazing system. The key point I want to make is we knew on that site when we, we crunched the numbers with that research that in the order to grow nine tonnes per hectare of growth annually on average, year in, year out, we were requiring 32 and a half kilograms of pure phosphorus to do that. Now, we were putting single super on in the order of seven and a half kilos of pure P, that's not a super rate, that's just the P component per hectare per year. So there's 25 kilos of phosphorus that that, that plant, that pasture found over that year to make that happen. It didn't all come from the bag. In fact, only a fraction of it came from the bag. So in order for that to have happened, we know that those microbes had to be breaking down and cycling phosphorus very nicely and healthily to have fed that available pool of phosphorus to make that happen. So that's, that's part one to that question. The other part to that question is we get this misconception about conventional products. Now I'll go back to single, but single super is often blamed for acidifying my soil. It's, it's the thing, I, I think I've got a pH drop, higher aluminium, lower pH, and it's due to that single super. That is incorrect, that is false. It is, the reason people make that link, it's, it's an indirect effect, it wouldn't matter whether it's single super, whether it's rock phosphate, whether it's agri-ash, whatever other product out there that's got a lot of phosphorus in it. If you put a product on that's gonna drive, um, you drive growth, so if you've got an and the situation arises when you have an annual, more annual-based pasture system, very few perennials present, so annual grasses, annual legumes, you put that nutrient on, the phosphorus and sulphur in that situation, you will make the legume component really flourish. And when you get legumes growing well, they fix nitrogen very well. 
and so they are building the nitrogen levels in your soil. Now the, the problem is that nitrogen is a very mobile nu nutrient in the soil and will move when you get wetting and, and quite saturation sort of levels, you'll get nitrogen being moved from higher in the profile to lower in the profile. And if you haven't got an, a perennial pasture present, the risk of letting that run from here to here is very high. If, if you've got perennials there, you've got plants there all year round that can capture the N. But that movement of N from high to low is an acidifying process. It's the thing that actually causes a pasture, or a soil under a pasture to acidify. So there, there are two facts around this conventional sort of talk of damage, am I damaging my soil? It's, they're both incorrect and that we've got research as you can see to back it. All right, so lastly, and I think this is probably the, we, we, we need to sum things up and this is how I think is best we do it. How do you go home and now choose an appropriate fertiliser for your situation, for your pasture grazing situation? Well, I think first of all, you've got to make some decisions in your head. What's your objective for this pasture? Are, are you into trying to, to build it, to make, make it grow for productivity reasons, putting more stock on, making money out of it, keeping it sustainable? Or are you just lock, wanting it as an environmental sort of area and lock it up, not touching it? Once you make that call, then you can move forward. If it's for growth, then the first step is that you need to work out what your deficiencies or toxicities are. Where, where's your status sit today? And we've given you um, a handout that comes from this Five Easy Steps booklet. And that's, there's a one-pager in your, your little folder that actually steps you through the key things that you need to consider when taking a soil test. So we make a decision on one number. So you need some quality, you need a quality, a number with quality <laughs> that's collected knowing that you have taken it properly, that it's representative of the area in question. So please read those, those points and you, you will have a quality number if you follow it. The next point is, I guess you, you ne then once you know your deficiencies, toxicities, you need to look around and look at what fertilisers are out there and base your decision on what you might try on a nutrient analysis. So, I get, and the other point would be always be checking, you know, there's some sort of often way out products out there, you, you would want to check for contaminants and any sort of hazardous sort of products as well, but uh, uh, components in it. But, but the nutrient analysis and the form of the nutrient is the thing that should drive you in that area. And when you, you're seeking this information, you know, ask suppliers, ask various people that you're getting info from, is there any evidence of product performance? If there isn't, and there's likely to be big gaps, because I mean that's why Lewis and I have, I guess, moved into this space to a large degree, is that there's a lot of gaps in this area, and we've tried to, to help fill some to a point, but there's no better thing than you as a person on the land actually putting in some test strips of your own of the products. But always compare, as Lewis strongly pointed out, a nil control is essential. And also, it's nice to have a standard practice on, on one side to know, well, this is what I have been doing. How does it rank in, in relation to this? And the other thing is to, when you, you need to lock these little areas up for a period in spring, and we're suggesting in the order of sort of six weeks or so, so that you keep animals away from them and you can start to see growth responses happen and you'll be able to pick what's going on. If you leave animals in there, they will go and selectively graze areas and, and you'll have no idea what, what works. The other thing is this cost costing. It's critical that you put a value on the nutrients that you're putting out and also account for any freight 
issues, freight charges and also spreading. You can see my spreading costs in that first presentation show there's huge variation there on a per hectare basis. It has to be accounted for. Um, and I've given a sheet in the little folder again that does step you through trying to cost out some of the, the nutrients that go into fertilisers to help you through that. So they're the steps that basically allow you to start to make a more rational decision about what might be required. The other part to this is, is rates of fertiliser. So how do I work out, I've got a fertiliser I want to use, but how do I work out what rate? Well, this again, this Five Easy Steps um, publication that actually was um, instigated and compiled by Richard Simpson, Phil Graham um, and two others, Lloyd Davies from DPI and Eric Zercher from CSIRO. And they came together and compiled a lot of research work that had gone in to try and then start to help you match projected soil fertility with stocking rate. And as part of that process of matching those two things, soil fertility and stocking rate, we talk rates of how much fertiliser do I need to put on to match a, an appropriate stocking rate to get soil P levels to a certain level. It, it's one of the, I guess, key pieces of research I think out there in our extension package that is, is almost vital, I think, for most people on the land to, to actually do or read. We, we in YAS run some workshops when we get enough people interested, we'll pull together a two half day workshop on that to try and step you through that process. Uh, because it is, it, it's not rocket science, but it's, it's quite tedious and it, you know, it, it requires some thinking as you go and it's nice to have a, someone to help, help, help you along with that. So the last point really is, I think this idea of monitoring and we're not telling you to go out and monitor all paddocks. It's about picking key areas where you're doing something quite well or you, you know, you've put a new product on and you're wanting to see what happens over time. In order to really know, you've got to monitor it annually um, to be able to pick up key nutrient changes. It's not till you get a number of data points that you will start to be able to see trend lines. So, you know, doing it less frequently while you're in a building up phase of nutrient, it, it's essential to do it annually. So that, we'll leave it at that. Thank you.